All right, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 12 is the section we're in. Um, we had gotten about halfway through um, verse 11. This is the section on Paul's prayer for the sanctification of the Colossians. Uh, that is, uh, to you know, wanting to review a little bit, we're going to be doing a little bit of a review. Sanctification, you know, often Christians get focused on the justification part of it and leave out the rest. Uh, people get saved and then think that, that it, that's where it ends. I, I got saved. Well, God expects and desires his plan is for you to grow. You know, salvation is not limited to your justification where you know, the salvation of your spirit, but there's also the salvation of your soul and the salvation of your body. And uh, you may have heard the terms justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is the salvation of your spirit, whereby by faith you accept Christ as your savior and you are given a new spirit and become a child of God. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Glorification will happen at the resurrection when Christ returns, and we will be given new bodies, uh, bodies that are immortal, no more, no more uh, prone to death. Sanctification is the process whereby God transforms our minds uh, Romans chapter 12 says, uh, Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is sanctification, where God changes the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we act. Um, I've had people ask me before, so, you know, God isn't, doesn't like me you know, the way I am. He's going to make me into a, a different person. I said, no. I said, God is going to make you into the person that you were always meant to be. He's going to take your broken bones and he's going to straighten them and mend them. He's going to cleanse your wounds and bind them up and help them to heal. I said, when, when we get on the other end of this, we're still going to be different people from one another. We're still going to have different preferences and and personality traits and everything. But we will be the Jebediah that we are always meant to be, or the Heidi, or the Jerry. You will, we're wounded and damaged right now. And God, through the process, through this whole process, he's going to cleanse us and heal us and fix us and enable us to be the person he always intended us to be. And so this prayer, um, he had earlier thanked God for their justification. And now he's praying for their sanctification. And in the beginning of his prayer in verse 9, he prays that they might be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Um, with all, you know, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Um, wisdom is skillfulness. This is knowing how to take the knowledge and how to put it into practice. And understanding is to understand these things, you know, spiritual understanding. The Bible says that the things of God cannot be understood by the flesh, by the lost. It has to be, give, this understanding has to come from God. You cannot understand the word of God without the Holy Spirit. It is just foolishness to you. I have seen that in my life many times when trying to witness to people. You know, there's this process in communication called uh, feedback, you know, where you're feeding it back to the person to see if you understand what they're telling you. And so sometimes people will do that with you. And uh, I had a person say to me, well, you believe if you're not good enough, you can't go to heaven. And I said, that's, that's not what I believe at all. 
And this, and I've seen that over and over again, and I, as a young Christian, I was very puzzled as to why this was. Well, it's because spiritual things cannot be understood by the lost. They do not have the capacity to understand them without the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's why sometimes you, know, you find yourself dealing with these people and they just, it seems like as if you're speaking a different language because you're not able to communicate these ideas to them. So he prays that they might be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. In, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So not just to have the facts, but to know, to understand them and how to use them in their lives. I was uh, speaking with Pastor Wago before uh, services started, and I said very much this reminds me of a person who gets involved in sports or a physical um, health regimen there's the part where you have to be educated. You have to know how to do it right, or else you could end up hurting yourself. You know, and that's what we have in verse 9, is we have to learn. You know, if you think about it, depending on when you were saved, up to that point, you had been filling your mind with the world's way of thinking. And... When it comes to issues of right and wrong and priorities of what's important, the world has most of that wrong. And so you have to, you have to go through a process of unlearning and you know, emptying yourself of the old and imbibing the new. I was, you know, the Bible says that we're to love our enemies and to not seek revenge. I come from a background quite opposite to that. Um, my dad taught me, as he was taught, that if someone disrespected your family and you didn't do something about it, he would do something about it when I got home. I was expected to respond to slights and such with violence. If I, got, if I got sent home from school because I had been violent in defense of uh, the honor of my family, then it, that was fine. That was, that was actually the right thing to do. That's how I was raised. That's how I was raised to think. Well, the Bible, you know, when I first got saved, I had to... I had to change that. I had to start learning, like, okay, no, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And so for a long time, I had to, I would play out because I didn't want to be caught in a situation where something would happen and I didn't know how to respond. So I would pre-think these scenarios, saying, okay, if such and such a thing happens, how ought I to respond as a Christian? What does the Word of God say about this? Well, I ought to do thus and thus. You know, the, the things that we're supposed to do are laid out for us by Christ, very simply. You, you, pray, for, you pray for those who are doing evil to you. You pray for them. You speak well to them. And you seek opportunities to do good for them. It's just very simple. It's not complicated. I like that. It's direct. So this is why this is necessary. Because and even if you got saved at a young age, the world is constantly, through all these various forms of introduction, the news, popular entertainment peer pressure, whatever, is constantly pushing a world philosophy on you. And so we need to get involved, invest ourselves in this process of changing the way we think so that we have the priorities of heaven, the values of heaven. Um, I don't hear it as much now as I used to, but for a while there, there was a phrase that was being uh, bandied about quite a bit, was a philosophy of life. 
Well, we need a philosophy of life that is drawn from the word of God that reflects God's philosophy of life. We can't get that from the world. So the first step in any physical regimen is you have to know the proper techniques. You have to learn. Well, then, you know, you have to, you know, exercise that. You have to get stronger, build up your strength. Um, I took Taekwondo at one point. And uh, I remember um, very first day, he told us to do 100 push-ups at one point. And, um, and then at one point, he just told everybody to stop, get up, and do something else. And we did a lot of exercise, a lot of it. And I told him afterwards, I said, I wasn't even able to get anywhere close to 100 push-ups. He goes, that's okay, you'll get there. And so in verse 10, we're told that the reason that we're to, to be filled with all knowledge is that, you know, filled with the knowledge of the will of God, is that we might walk worthily of the Lord. You know, this is to have a practical effect. This isn't just for the purpose of uh, bragging rights that you know so much so that you can impress people with your th theological conversation. I was telling a friend of mine, uh, I said, you know, some of those terms we learn in Bible college, the only place we ever use those is in Bible college. I said, I'm not saying they're not useful. They are because... Um, it, it lends precision to the conversation. I said, but when you're talking to normal people, you have to figure, you know, you have to figure out a different way of saying that stuff, or else people won't understand what you mean. Justification is pretty much only used by us. <laughs> Things like justification, sanctification, glorification. In fact, I heard someone in regular, in regular conversation use the word glorified, and that totally caught me off guard. I was like, what? Did, you just said glorified? <laughs> I was like, I normally don't hear that outside of religious conversation. But this, that isn't what this is for. This isn't so you can sound smart or to satisfy your curiosity. It's so that it can, so that your decisions will be informed from a proper basis of knowledge. So to reflect back on, you know, that martial training that I was given. Uh, how do I respond to insult and injury? The Bible says that I am to not act against the person, but actually to seek to act in their benefit. So, you know, my decisions need to be informed by a proper framework, and that framework needs to be drawn from the Word of God. So, so the purpose in sanctification, you know, of filling our minds with the knowledge of God, with understanding, so that we know what the right priorities and values are, is so that it impacts our life in a practical way, so that we walk correctly, that is, live correctly. Um, when I was in training, you know, I, I used to be, before my health took a big downturn, I used to be involved in all kinds of sports. At one point I was on the swim team, um, I was on a football team, um, I got involved in Taekwondo, um, I rode 16 miles a day on my bicycle. Um, I just was very, very physically active. When I was around uh, 19, 18, 19 years old, my doctor told me I was healthy like a horse. That's what he said, you're healthy like a horse. <sighs> Most I ever rode on my bicycle in one day was 60 miles. And I remember at the end feeling, not feeling tired, but feeling like, like radiating heat. I just, I felt like a furnace. <laughs> it felt bit like my whole system was revved up. And so I used to, I used to be very, phys I know I don't look it now, but I used to be very physically active and into 
and you have to um, learn the proper techniques or else you will hurt yourself and could hurt yourself very badly. Um, then in verse 11, which, were, uh, which we've covered half of, he said that, you know, part, continuing this prayer, remember this is one prayer, this is all connected. Also something I, I brought up to pastor that I need to bring out with you. Everything after verse 10 is modifying, through verse 12, is modifying that, that phrase, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Everything afterwards is written in a structure that it's modifying that. It's giving us additional information about that walking worthy. So then in verse 11, he prays that they might be strengthened with all might. And I brought out last week that what that means, it, literally what it's saying is um, by all ability enabled. You know, this is, you know, the Bible says that without God we can do nothing. That we must spiritually, we must draw on the ability to do what we need to do from outside of ourselves. Just like physically, if we are not maintaining proper intake of nourishment and water, um, our ability to do what we need to do will fail. You know, there are a lot of physical, every time, you know, all of these um, different spiritual concepts that the Bible talks about, there's almost every time that I've seen, there is a physical analogy that works. Um, the Bible says to do all things in moderation. And I've told my children, I said, if you, you know, I said, when it comes to eating and drinking, if you do too much of anything, it will hurt you. Even water, too much water will hurt you. I was involved in a youth camp where a young man, I got called, and a young man was laying on the ground, unable to move, and he was starting to panic. And uh, the, an ambulance was called. He was taken to the hospital. And word came back um, that his electrolytes, basically his salts, had dropped too low in relation to his blood volume. And that was causing certain bodily functions to start failing. Too much water can kill you. But so can too much of anything. Um, Back when that Adkins diet was so, so fat, such the fad, and you had all these people trying to lose weight by just eating meat, um, there is a young lady who um, experienced, a, she was just out of high school and experienced kidney failure because she did that. And for the rest of her life, the doctor said, you are going to have to be very careful about your meat intake. You've You've permanently da damaged your body's ability to handle that. So for the rest of her life, she's going to have to be careful. You know, too much of anything can, can hurt you. And so we need, just like we need nourishment and water, proper balance, um, we try to eat a wide variety of vegetables, fruits and vegetables, different kinds of meats, different kinds of grains, because um, we want to get the nourishment, the proper nourishment that we need. And just like you need proper nourishment to sustain your life and your ability to function, uh, Mrs. Coy collapsed because her blood sugar dropped too low, did not have enough energy to function. Well, we need that from God. But just like... Um, nourishment does more than give you energy. Um, nourishment gives you the building blocks to, to repair itself. Even so, the resources that we're receiving from God do more than just give us uh, an energy. They, they, 
they change the way we think about things. They change the way we, you know, how we feel, how we speak, how we act, all of these things. So we need to draw, we need to have this resource from God. And we get that through prayer and through going to him as our resource and through um, filling ourselves with the word of God and praying and, and, and going to the throne of grace and asking for that need to be met. And it says it's according to his glorious power. So this isn't according to our natural capabilities, but according to him, according to his ability to do. Uh, Jesus said, without me, to his disciples, he said, without me, you can do nothing. And again, the Bible says that it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So without that resource from God, we cannot do the things that we ought to do. So he prays that they might receive that enabling, that strength from God. Now then, getting us up to speed, the last half of verse 11, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. I entitled this part, metal, <laughs> with metal. For those, it's an older word, might not be, um, familiar with it. Uh, your metal refers to how much does it take you take to make you quit or to break. That's what this is talking about. Um, I heard someone one time say, and th this showed that they had a lack of understanding of, the, of what the phrase means, but um, why do we say, you know, don't, you know, it's not good to have a bad temper. You shouldn't have a temper at all. And I, I had to explain to him. I said, that's not what temper means. Temper isn't a bad thing. A temper is, back when they uh, made swords, they had to do, they, they had to walk this fine line in making the sword. They wanted it to be flexible to a certain degree so that it wouldn't break. But they also wanted it to be hard enough to hold an edge. And so over the centuries, they perfected this, this craft. And how they would test a blade to see its temper is they would affix the point of it in something to hold it, in some kind of locking mechanism to hold it, and then they would bend it. And then they would let it go. And if it was able to go back straight, it had a good temper. But if, if it, you know, um, if the blade creased or, or you know, re developed an actual, you know, bend in the metal, then that was a bad temper. And so that's where that phrase comes from. And this phrase, metal, also refers back to that whole, it's one of the words used in relation to that, is what does it take to make you quit? What does it take to, to break you? Um, I was speaking to a retired Navy SEAL, and we were talking about Hell Week. If those of you who are at all familiar, you'll, you'll know what that is. But what that is is they, um, they, they take the Navy SEALs, the final portion of them becoming a Navy SEAL is they put them through a horrific series of trials. And some of them seem very strange. And I asked this man about it, and he said, the entire purpose of Hell Week, I said, is that just to, you know, like, you know, make you stronger and everything? He goes, no, no, they're all, you're already past that point. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's to get you to quit. 
I was like, they want you to quit? And he said, yes. If there is anything in you that would cause you to want to quit at that point, before they make, you know, because they rely on these men and women to a great degree. And so if there's anything that would make you quit, they want that to come out before they finally, you know, put their stamp of approval on you. So it's like that testing of the blade. They want to see, will it break? If it doesn't break, it's a blade that is good and may be used. And so that's, that's that, uh, that tempering process of seeing if the thing will break. Part of this process is to um, find out, you know, or to create in us um, that ability to not quit, not break. And that's why I entitled it Metal. He uses two words here, um, all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. He says, uh, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. The, long, the patience and long-suffering are two wor different words that are very similar to each other. Patience is hupamane. Uh, its basic meaning is steadfastness. Constancy, endurance. It's, uh, it comes from the word meno, which means to abide or remain. And hupa meno means to remain under. So it was used on the idea of to remain under a burden. That was endurance. It reminds me of the story of the man who... Um, he, he's often cited in, in physical training things as the earliest case of a bodybuilder. He was a Greek, and he set himself a regimen. Is, uh, he didn't have all the sophisticated weight training machines they do now, so he took a, um, a young bull calf, and he put it on his shoulders. And he would do exercises with the calf on his shoulders. And he would do that every day as it grew bigger and bigger. Now, I'm pretty sure, because as big as those things get, I'm pretty sure he didn't get it to full grown. But um, that's that idea, you know, stay, you know, not quitting. When I was doing weight training, they told us to go for positive failure. That's where you, you lift the weight. You know, you, you don't stop just because it hurts. You stop because your body has stopped. And I, I remember one of the first times I experienced that. I was doing uh, bench press, and I was going, 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 go, uh, uh, <laughs> you know. And I could not, for all of me, get it off my chest anymore. It was, it was done. And I was very silly. I was doing that by myself. <laughs> I was like, oh, great, now what do I do? <laughs> so I ended up having to kind of roll off the bench and drop the weights on the ground. But staying under the weight. And as you increased your strength, your ability, you know, your ability to keep lifting the weight would increase. And this is the endurance. Hupameno is the idea of how long can you keep at a task before your strength fails you? That's endurance. And he's praying that they have all endurance so that they do not reach the point that they have no more strength. William, my oldest, he'll complain at times you know, about failing to be able to do something or not to be able to do it anymore. And I'll say, that's okay. You're still a very little guy. And you, you'll grow, you'll learn, you'll become more able. Long-suffering is similar. Um, 
It means patience, forbearance, long-suffering. This, this sounds like similar words, and they are, but there's a slight distinction. Long-suffering is macrothumia. Macrothumia literally means long-heated. Thumia is heat. Macro is, is long, long-heated. And how this word was used was um, it's the idea of how long, just like uh, um, hupa mane means how long does it take for you to get to where you're unable to keep going. Macrothumia is how long before emotionally and mentally you find yourself um, failing. This is, you know, I've heard people say everyone has a breaking point, you know, of, of uh, keeping your temper and losing your, your positive spirit and such. And, you know, I, I find it interesting God's response to cases like that in the Bible. When Elijah had reached his breaking point, I thought it was interesting that the, he sent the angel to uh, minister to him. The angel wasn't very uh, gentle about it, but he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't condemn him. He didn't tell him, say, hey, you're doing the wrong thing. You have the wrong attitude. You need to pray right and act right. He said, eat. Go to sleep. Wake up, eat, go back to sleep. Wake up, God wants to talk to you. <laughs> um, one, one thing that we, and this is a little bit of a practical advice on dealing with people who are, you know, your Christian brethren, who are, they seem to be facing depression or um, struggling with, like, they're just, they're going to quit. They just feel, you know, overwhelmed. Before you jump on the spiritual side of it, you really ought to ask them, how are you eating? How are you drinking? How are you sleeping? Because those greatly affect um, our ability to maintain a... Um, Maintain self-control in relation to our attitudes and our, and our emotions. I shared this with you last week, but my brother told me that the official position of the United States military is that once you've been awake, and I think it's 72 hours, if I remember correctly. If you've been awake 72 hours, you cannot be held responsible for your actions. I've read, I've read up on uh, sleep deprivation studies where they made people stay awake and the people started hallucinating and acting very strange. So we need to remember that there's a physical side to this. You know, ask them. You know, we are, we're more than just our minds. We're bodies too. And that they can affect each other. And so we need to check with people and say, how are you doing? You know, are you getting rest? Are you getting food? Are you getting water? If somebody's really sick and they're having a, a bad attitude, sure, they, not, they ought not to have a bad attitude, but we ought to temper our reaction with the understanding that sometimes in the face of suffering, it is very hard to have a positive um, demeanor and a positive attitude about things. So Paul's prayer here, it's two-sided. He prays, that they, are, that they have the strength to keep doing what they need to do, but also he prays that when they're facing adverse circumstances, um, I one time heard it said about macrothumia, long-suffering, is um, uh, the idea of not responding negatively to provocation. That this is... Um, not being broken in our attitudes, our thinking and such by our circumstances. So they're very similar to each other, but they're two 
two different sides of this uh, concept. And so just like in physical training, there comes a point where you feel like, oh man, this isn't progressing fast enough. I'm going to quit. You know, you have to make yourself, when you exercise, you have to make yourself keep lifting, even though it hurts. Keep lifting, keep doing the exercise, and you'll build up your strength, you'll build up your endurance. That's the hupa mene side. But then there's the part of you that can get discouraged because things aren't progressing fast enough. And, um, and so our spirit becomes distressed by that. I had a trainer, most valuable thing, you know, for dealing with that that I had ever heard. He said, it's good to have a goal in mind, but in the doing of it, focus on doing better this time than you did last time. So the end goal, Christ-likeness. That seems like the moon for us, so far away. But what we need to do, you know, God kept telling Israel to remember where they had been. They had a goal of where they were going, but remember where they had been. We need to remember and see how God has progressed us in this growth of sanctification. Yes, we're not there yet. We haven't received Christ-likeness. But by the grace of God, we're not the people that we were. And by his grace... Maybe tomorrow we won't be the people we were today. Day by day, growing in the knowledge and grace of the Lord. And so his, you know, as we go through this, our ability to keep going. You know, Pastor, you've shared with us about the cranies reaching this point of, of burnout. And you didn't, you know, get on them and and condemn them, you just said, okay, take a break. Soak in the love, soak in the word of God, and when you're ready, let me know. And that's what happened. We need to be patient with one another and understanding, and patient with ourselves, realizing that there is a growth process in this. Um, I'm out of time, so we'll continue next week with the but the rest of this verse is just the final phrase with joyfulness, and then we'll get into verse 12. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your word. I pray that you might be with the services today. Pray that you might uh, be with Pastor Weigel, fill him with your Holy Spirit, and speak through him, that we might be transformed by your word, that we might become more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Pray that if there might be any lost with us today, that they might come to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and that they might grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord. I pray you be with those. Your word tells us to minister to one another in, in, in music and in song. And I pray that you be with those who are bringing the music to us and, and use it, Father, to prepare our hearts for the reception of your word and to focus us on the things of you. Pray, bless now in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.